All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the first episode of the Soccer Performance Podcast. Today's our first episode. Um, my name is Juan Padaroy. I'm the head trainer here at Athlete Lab. My good friend here, Coach Mario Artukovic, is my co-host in this podcast. I'm going to let him introduce himself a little bit more. All right, so my name is Mario. I'm a strength and conditioning coach here in the GTA. Uh, grew up here, played soccer here, and then eventually went abroad um, to do my master's and work abroad in UK and in Asia. And now I'm back reconnecting with Juan, and uh, we've decided to start this so we can bring some value, hopefully, to the soccer community here. Nice. So we want to start the conversation by kind of giving, giving um, you know, you guys some context as to as to who we are and, and wh- what our background is in training. So why don't you start off by by talking about you know your transition from athlete to to trainer? Right. So I played soccer growing up here, like many. Um, I had to stop at 17 though. I had a spinal surgery, scoliosis, and so that was a long recovery, two years out. And you know, at that age, you know, you're missing some valuable opportunity to develop, and that. However, I decided to get into coaching, technical coaching here in Milton. Uh, that's when I got drawn to coaching. I always loved the tactical and technical side of the game and, and mm-hmm. that stuff, which eventually led to me deciding to pursue kinesiology at McMaster. And from there, I learned a lot more about the physical side. So from coaching the technical part of the game, I transitioned a lot to more of the fitness side. And, uh, learned Just from a lot your experience there. as a player, right? Exactly, right? So I guess from injury, that caused me to transition to the coaching uh, aspect. And I think a lot of people have a similar story and I think you're kind of... Yeah, no, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I mean, I uh, same thing. I mean, I want to say that my technical knowledge comes from just playing. I think I, I think that's the only way to, to, to gain that, that type of, of knowledge. But just like Mario, I, um, I had a, a, an injury that, that, that kind of changes perspective. I tore my ACL. And so just like you, I, I, I shifted from playing to coaching from just the change in my environment and and then you realize there's a bit of a passion in there too so I kind of wanted to ask you that do you you know you don't you, you originally I think change from player to coach kind of like as a second choice right and then you kind of then realize you know what there's actually a lot of growth and there's a lot of passion and there's a lot of room for for success in that training world where now coaching I see myself being even more rewarded sometimes when I work with other players so um, I'll ask you kind of how you now structure your training in terms of how you merge technical training from your experiences as a player to then obviously your your knowledge why don't you go into more about what you did beyond um, your, your your time at McMaster right so um, I've mainly kind of went to the physical side and I'm always learning, trying to see, you know, how can we transfer what's on the physical side onto the pitch. Sometimes it's not always about transfer, it's just about keeping you healthy and stuff like that. So for example, you know, me looking back, I'm trying to learn a lot of things I wish I knew when I was a player, or at least someone was able to teach me. So I'm sure there's, you wish that there's someone who could have helped possibly prevent the ACL injury and yeah. as we become educated there is a lot of things you can do to prevent that um, with training and all that stuff um, so that why that's why you know after McMaster I was working all around the GTA driving around you know working with OPDL teams in Toronto here yeah. here around Oakville Burlington um, but eventually decided to pursue a master's in the UK because I really wanted to learn a lot about you know a lot of the soccer and sports science side of things. Right. Um, that's where I got involved with a professional club there, Crew Alexandra. I got to be involved in the academy there, and that's what right. really blew my mind, seeing what the academy system's like overseas and how far we are behind here. Because through our playing days, um, the system is very different, or quite different than it is now. It's improved a lot now, right. but I think we still have a long ways to go, and um, that's why... You know, I want to at least bring some of what I learned there combined with my education and, and let's try and right. try and close the gap a bit if we can. No, I like when you, and you said the fact that, you know, you're you're trying to fill the gaps that you saw as a player. Right. You're trying to fill the gaps that you saw here. I mean, everybody gets gets uh, an, an opportunity to see that when, when you're involved in the game. And that's I'm, I'm on the same page. Once you start coaching and you start looking at it from a perspective of helping other people, um, you realize that you just want to provide what, what maybe you were looking for when, when 
when you were growing up or, or in times of need, like your, your surgery. Um, but that was like me as well. I, I shifted my focus from, from, you know, wanting to pursue playing to then just wanting to pursue being, being a high level trainer, working with high level players. And, and I also, you know, like you, I, I think I was a little bit more dominant on the technical side of things, but I saw the value in, in physical training and I just had a general, you know, interest in it. And so just like you, um, with your experience at Big Master, actually Mario being the, the catalyst for that for me, um, I did a summer internship that truly opened my eyes to real training and, and, and he's actually one of the, the, the ones that recommended that. Shout out to, to the guys at Mac, Ben and, and, the, and the team there. Uh, because that kind of opened my eyes to, to real training and that opened my eyes to like what Mario was saying, you can truly impact somebody, prevent an injury or, or highly reduce that. And I think, uh, you know, that's kind of the, w w what has us here. Um, I want to ask you kind of from your experience, you know, from before and now that you're, that you're back, what do you see? What do you see in terms of what do you think? What, th what do you think has improved in, in the Canadian football structure? What do you think has stayed the same? Um, you know, what would you do to change things? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Well, I mean, for sure, it's improved a lot. Like when we played, we didn't have an OPDL system. Mm -hmm. um, coaches are, are a lot more educated than when we played. Um, so the technical development and the coaching instruction is improving. Um, we're seeing with the national team kind of at the grassroots level, you know, the younger guys coming up, they're much more skillful. They're able to play, get mm -hmm. into MLS teams. They're able to play abroad. So it is improving. Yeah. Um, that being said, we still lack a proper academy structure. For example, we have three professional academies in the country, right, with three MLS clubs. Mm -hmm. You go in the UK, they have academies at, in four or five divisions. So that's academies, and it's free, right? Players come up here, it's pay to play. Their right. players are free. They have salaried staff, coaches, physical performance coaches, physiotherapists working to help prevent such injuries, right. and they're trying to develop talent for the future. So this is a big gap that we have. Unfortunately, it's a lot of pay to play here. Um, so will that improve in the future? I hope so. Like we have the Canadian professional league and mm -hmm. perhaps that will grow into something, but at the same time, you know, waiting for that to happen, you know, is probably not the ideal situation. You know, we, so if we can bring some more education, some more values to players exactly. where they could come to places such as athlete lab and, and, and kind of work on those deficits and, and improve mm -hmm. the physical side of the game. Um, I think that can, you know, players taking that initiative upon themselves to close that gap is, is you know, is, exactly. is the way to go for now and, uh, you know, working with uh, progressive minded individuals. Yeah, uh, no, I think that's it. Like you said, it taking initiative right now. I think changing a culture takes time and you can start by attacking that, you know, individually. Um, but I think like, you know, and it goes down to what you said. I mean, the there is these new systems in place and there's a lot more opportunity. Um, but I still think there's gaps in the training. I think there's improvements in structure, right? Levels of how players can be exposed to certain, you know, national teams and provincial teams and whatever. But the, you know, the actual meat and potatoes of, of what you're looking for in an academy, a good coaching, you know, a, a good culture, a good environment, that still is, is, I think, you know, the biggest thing to change. And like you said, I think the, the, the CPL is is that 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 first step where that second step is mm -hmm. can you have academies underneath that pro team can you have opportunities to earn your playing time can you have opportunities to earn your spot on a on on, on a on a club because that's what it is i think there's too there's too much sheltering when you're paying to play and unfortunately it's it's inevitable because it's an expensive place to live and to play but I think slowly, like Mario's saying, it's, you know, it's inevitable. Some things, it's up to you as an individual to, to, to do more, right? I'll ask you this. If you were, if you were a 15-year-old soccer player today, what would, I wouldn't say you necessarily, but what would you recommend to a 15-year-old who's playing, you know, call it OPDL or any high-level rep soccer in terms of extra training, what, what is your recommendation? If I'm somebody who's asking you, listen, I want to do more, what should I do? What would yeah, you tell sure. Well, first, I want to just elaborate on sure. kind of where your first point is, because I think that relates. Um, 
Like it is growing, and I think one of the most important things is like these clubs. For example, you have a good setup here. You have a partnership with yeah, yeah. with Milton with close Milton by. Magic. So at l and shout out to my Milton Magic. Family. So at least there's <laughs> like that some sort of continuity, right? The players have the te technical instruction. You're involved right. there. You know the coaches. There is some continuity, mm -hmm. some sort of let's say academy structure. So for example, in professional clubs, right? The performance coaches work alongside the technical coaches. Exactly. Everything is kind of trying to play off each other. And let's say uh, you're my technical coach. Mm -hmm. We make the training plan together and I'm kind of doing in the gym or on the pitch. It's mirroring off what you're doing and assisting with what you're doing. And Correct. over there, the physical, they have a physical development curriculum. So guys coming in under 13, under 14, you know, they're developing certain foundations. And as they progress to under 15, 16s right. to 18s, they're starting to progress physically and starting to prepare for the first team game. Right. So if we're thinking about the under 15 player here, right, know that your competition, right, if they're in these, uh, right, if you're trying to play at a very high level, note mm -hmm. that your competition is likely getting this kind of service and they're developing them to eventually get the first team level. They're establishing foundations at your age. So taking exactly. your physical training seriously, you know, so for the guys over in Milton, you know, taking the stuff here at Athlete Lab seriously, um, building your foundational strength, some power, some speed, right. getting that extra conditioning on the side. As, and, you know, I know you do a lot of technical work here, but showing up to those sessions, really making sure that you do your best to be an all round player, not just focusing completely on the ball, because at the higher levels, players are fitter. They are technically very good, but they are fitter. You cannot deny that. They're stronger. They're faster. Right. Um, so, and even just from an injury uh, exactly, prevention exactly. Right? And, and even there, if, if all that training just prevents you from Getting hurt, a yeah. knee injury, a hamstring, or an ankle injury, I mean, that, that's well, well worth it, too. Because I think you've you got to spend uh, most of your time on the pitch. Yeah, and course. if you're sitting and recovering, well, then you're losing valuable chance to grow. Of course. No, and I think that's it. It's, it's about adding, nobody's asking, nobody's saying that you have to become, you know, somebody who loves attending the gym or loves doing technical sessions, but you just have to have a, a balance. I think that if you were to look at a professional structure, there's a large amount of, um, you know, structure, right? And so players are getting everything they need because they're in a, an academy that's structured by people who know what they're doing and by people who have experience in a professional setting. Um, and if you compare that to a youth structure where it's designed ma mainly to provide physical activity to the masses, right? Because that's what it's there to do and, 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 and provide structure for, for kids. It's not designed to produce necessarily professional athletes, right? It's not designed to produce professional soccer players. So I think as, cult, as the culture starts to change and you're starting to see that, and, but again, it takes huge initiatives like, like pro leagues, like, you know, sub leagues under these pro leagues. Like now I'm seeing MLS pro and I'm seeing CPL and then you have USL league one, league two. And so there's so many opportunities to- MLS two is coming as well. Yeah, you have incredible amounts of, of stages, right? To, to present yourself. And so I just think if it's an investment when you're putting you know, time and, and money into extra training outside of your club structure. But at the end of the day, if you're only getting two, three training sessions a week, one game, there's still three days a week. And if you're gonna compete with somebody around the world who's training seven days a week, you kind of have to make do with, 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 with what you got, right? Not to mention, uh, back in the day, how many extra hours we've, we've played just going, playing on the street, and you go anywhere in Europe or South America, guys are just, yeah. most of their training time is away from structured play. 100%. And so they're developing a lot of technical skills, playing indoor, on the street, on the 100%. pitch with their friends, at school. Um, so, uh, no, and you're right about that because it's, and I, and I think I ha had this conversation with you before, but unfortunately because of cultural changes and because of so much you know sitting and just being closed in and not being able to go outside and you you don't have the same volume of kids playing outside even if it's multi-sport because you know we'll get into a conversation like this in the future um but by just building coordination skills balance stability from your basic pickup basketball game or your basic hockey you know street hockey game which is not as common as it used to be, you're getting these basic foundational building blocks. And unfortunately, you know, it is like that, but we're trying to provide 
some something structured that that balances that right i think nowadays it's 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 nice if i'm a parent to say hey i can bring my kid to work more on himself in a place where i can trust and i think that's kind of what, what i'm trying to do what i know you're trying to do mm-hmm. um but i'll ask you this to to kind of you know wrap up the the first episode what um what, what do you want to get out of this podcast what are you trying to yeah what do you what are you trying to get and what are you trying to bring to this to this podcast yeah i think we touched on it quite a bit so uh, we've spent a lot of time the last years coaching uh, investing in our education and you know, mm-hmm. working with other coaches and learning from them. Um, so, and on, so if we can at least bring some of that into a digestible format for the, for anyone who's watching where they can learn, you know, even a couple things that they can apply to their own training and, or, or the way they view their training. Um, then I feel like we, we've, you know, we've helped to improve the game and, um, yeah. you know, um, I've got a bunch of contacts in mind, you know, from around the world, and you've got some contacts that we, yeah, we plan sure. to bring on, uh, hopefully soon, and we can we can have some very, very valuable discussions, um, not just about the physical side of the game, but everything technical, yeah. the development side, um, you know, the different cultures, and you know, from from clubs around Europe and in Asia. Um, yeah, as well as I think, local. I think we can bring a, bring a lot of value to here. Um, before that, I, the one question I did have for you. Um, mm-hmm. We have a couple minutes left. Um, you've been doing a lot more coaching here recently. I've been away for the last four years, but what is what is a big missing piece for the athletes that come in and train at an athlete lab? What is a big gap in their development that you see? Um, I think it's just, it goes back to time, right? I think it just goes back to time. You can tell when somebody's fresh at anything. You can tell when somebody hasn't ran much. You can tell when somebody, if I'm new to the piano, like you can tell I don't have that, that specific rhythm that somebody who's been playing has, that specific style. And so you can see that. And then you can see kids that are just naturally in love with the game that find somehow, those, I'm talking about the kids that are in their basement doing keep-ups. You know, and, and not everybody, I think, starts off absolutely obsessed with the game. Right, and so the, that, it goes back to my point about playing on the street. Um, I think you get a lot of people here who, for the first time ever, are doing any sort of physical movement, right? And the craziest part is they've been enrolled in a team, they've been enrolled in a in a in a in a club. So I think because of, and I'm not trying to you know bash clubs or teams, but because of the structure, you know, being suited towards the the large numbers in in these settings a lot of individual things that are crucial foundations and crucial building blocks to to any athlete regardless of your sport i think are missing right i think when you have that that club structure like i said it's mainly to keep kids active um and i think and it's 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 a very niche world right i think taking taking youth development um and attacking it seriously is not is not common I know that you and I are in a field where, you know, everybody knows everybody because it's so small. And, and I think it's, it's about now filling that gap of, okay, there's such a lack of, you know, good foundation and good structure to youth that I think is overlooked. A lot of players will go right into finishing clinics, right? But don't know how to run, don't know how to jump, don't know how to land, but you can finish, right? And so if you look, okay, but this is going to be something that you need for mm-hmm. your entire career. I think that's where I think. So you're thinking a lot of basic fundamental yeah. athletic movements are missing 100%. with the players. Yeah, I see a lot of good footballers. Because that's what I've seen when I was coaching and driving around, you know, working with OPDL clubs yeah. four years ago. I imagine it's probably still the same, you know, not much has changed in, mm-hmm. in, in four years. But, uh, but you do come across the few that are gifted and, and do move quite well. But that's what I'm saying. You do yeah. come a lot of, across a lot of good soccer players. Yeah. but not many good athletes. And I'm not saying, and I know some soccer players will say, well, I'm a footballer, I'm not a sprinter, or I'm not a, but it goes back to what you were saying, movement efficiency, injury prevention. It's, it's not there to necessarily be the focus. It's there to, mm-hmm. to, to complement, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask you- 45 minute sessions a week? <laughs> 245 of what? Of you know, gym work and technical work? Uh, just a combination, or whatever, general, whatever, yeah. whatever, you know. You know, whether that's at home, you're on the pitch working on some con- yeah. extra conditioning, extra sprinting, a um, little bit of gym work, some stuff. We're going to 
put a lot of content out there. So I mean, yes. there's there's no reason why you can't allocate a bit of time to that. Let me ask yeah, you this sorry. to finish. On on the topic of extra training, intensity. How 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 much how important is intensity to those training sessions? I I, I say that because I find that a lot of players will just go and spend a lot of casual time, mm -hmm. and then consider that extra training. So with regards to intensity, like you said, 45 minutes, mm -hmm. right, of training, I'll let you kind of... Yeah, so I mean, we, we're going to spend a whole episode <laughs> talking about that, yeah. but long story short, I mean, the intensity, well, one, it depends what you're doing, right? So mm -hmm. if, if you want high quality technical work, you know, having shorter sessions, working at high intensity, right. high tempo, I know you guys train like that here, to really refine skills, moving, moving, you know, at maximum speed, right. you know, you know, you're mentally fresh, you're really trying to maximize your skill acquisition during that right. time. That's important. When it comes to the physical side, the intensity varies to your level. So some guys think Good. they want high intensity training, but no, they need to work on a lot of low intensity, build right. capacity, build foundation. So in t just like in the technical side, you know, if you're just learning a skill, mm -hmm. you're going to start low intensity, you're going to acquire your reps, and then you're going to gradually scale. Right. Um, but you know, if you can play and now you want to play faster, play faster, well, long drawn out training sessions are not going to accomplish that. So, I mean, there's like, um, you know, speaking to some colleagues overseas, uh, and, and some players who spent time in Spain, you know, mm -hmm. in Spain, a lot of times they'll train short sessions, uh, you know, two for 40 to 45 minute sessions, but they in are the same all out high tempo. Yeah. They go, right. they have a break, they eat lunch and they right. come back. So, and they, so they have two high quality sessions where another team, they'll go 90 minutes, minutes to two yeah. hours straight, but you cannot guarantee that you'll maintain quality during that time. So it's, it's, funny it's just how not mentally and physically, uh, plausible. Of right. And it's funny how like, that's such a foreign thing when then you look at the game and it's two 45 minute blocks, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I think this is a good way to close off the episode. I look forward to, you know, just like Mario said, uh, the, the goal of this episode, of this episode of the podcast is to give, you know, more than we want to, you know, get from it is, is what can we give to players and, and put ourselves in, a, in the perspective of young players and, and, and give some guidance. Yeah. All cool. right. So we have a lot to talk about and uh, hopefully stay tuned for the next episode. For sure. All right. See you later. <laughs>